Welcome everyone. It's so great to see you all here today. Um, I am gonna just jump right into things because I, I don't wanna take any time away from the beautiful conversation you're all about to hear. Um, so welcome to Past and Present with Allison Gilbert and Maria Kuban Weitzel. Uh, my name is Dara Kosberg. I am the program director at Reimagine. And our mission is to help people of all backgrounds face adversity, loss, and mortality, and channel the hard parts of life into meaningful action and growth. And first off, I do want to thank Domani for Grief um, for all of their support that makes this series possible. And um, I also just wanted to highlight a few Zoom tips here, but I think the big one is that if you want to see the live transcript, you can click the little CC at the bottom. And uh, we do encourage you to put your questions and comments into the chat throughout the program. Um, there will be a Q&A uh, at the end, um, but if you do find it distracting, you can always click that little X at the top left, or sorry, top right, and um, be able to, to close it. Uh, and then um, I just wanted, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, and one other thing just for the chat. Um, so uh, the majority of us are zooming in from the United States, also known as Turtle Island by Native Americans and their allies. And uh, we ask that you please join us in acknowledging indigenous communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Uh, this land acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to begin the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of colonialism, I'm on the land of the Tongva people, also known as Anaheim, California. Um, we do encourage you to share where you're calling in from today. And I will put a link in the chat um, where you can find the native lands that you are on. And uh, with that, I also just wanted to highlight, we have another wonderful upcoming past and present on March 31st with Dr. Jillian Norton and Hope Edelman. Um, which I'm sure will be wonderful. I also wanted to highlight that on March 7th, we have our monthly vigil, and this is going to be in honor of um, COVID Memorial Day, and we're doing this in partnership with Marked by COVID. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, your host for today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Allison. Uh, Allison Gilbert is the author of numerous books, including the forthcoming biography of first newspaper columnist, Elsie Robinson, to be published by Basic Books, Hatchet in 2022. Her most recent book, Past and Present, Keeping Memories of Loved Ones Alive, reveals creative ways to remember family and friends we never want to forget. Please follow Allison on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. She's everywhere as a Gilbert writer. And with that, uh, I will hand it off to Allison. Hi, everybody. I am so glad that it is the last Thursday of the month because that means I get to be here with all of you again. It's just my favorite part of the month. So welcome back. If you've been with us before, welcome to first timers. If you are new to the past and present series, um, let me tell you how this works. Pretty easy. Um, for the first 30 minutes or so, I'm going to be interviewing Maria, um, who I am so deeply honored is here today. Hey, Maria. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. Of course. So we're going to get to my conversation with Maria for sure. Um, and then after I speak with Maria for about a half an hour, if I haven't covered the question or questions that you've come here with today. I am not the only voice in this conversation. You have one too. And what I would like you to do is if a question comes to you while Marie and I are talking, please put your question in the chat. What will happen is that Christina, raise your hand, Christina, if you don't mind. Um, Christina will go through the chat during the conversation and find those questions that hopefully are applicable to the most people. And so 
we're trying to create a community in this one hour that we have where we all can feel supported, where we all can get our questions answered. And so the more um, broad you feel you can make your question as opposed to specific to your individual circumstance, it'll be more likely that Christina can use your question um, when we get to that part of the conversation. Um, one last disclaimer, it may not happen while we're on the call today, but if you are a repeat past and present uh, participant, you will notice I'm coming to you from a different location today. That is because there is massive construction happening in my house. And so if we hear drills, if we hear hammers, if we hear saws, I will mute myself hopefully and not interrupt my own question. I'll go right to Maria. Um, if those hammers and those drills and those saws upset my sleeping dog and my dog starts barking, I will mute myself and try to do this as seamlessly as possible. This is an unusual situation this month. So please forgive me in advance if any of those things happen. So Maria, I know by you in LA, it is early in the morning. You have just been on TV all morning. You are the Good Day LA Fox 11 morning news meteorologist. So of course in the chat, I would love people to say, are you from LA? Do you know <laughs> Maria from TV? Did you watch her this morning? And of course, how is the weather today in LA, Maria? It's very cold here in LA, actually. For those of you who are um, joining us from other parts of the world, I got to say that this is unusually cold for us. I think I saw a 38 degree temperature this morning for downtown LA when I first got to work and it hasn't been that cold or hasn't reached that temperature since January of 2019. So it's been a while since we've actually seen these types of, of temperatures. So I blame the Canadians because it's all this cold air coming in from Canada. Um, but but for those of you in Canada, you're like, ah, that's spring. Are you kidding me? We're we're such cold weather wimps here in SoCal. But it's 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 a sunny day and it does look good outside. Yes, it does. Well, it leads me really to my first question, and I want to get to the circumstances that bring you to this conversation about grief and loss. But the most obvious question to me, when I look at you and I begin to see your personality shine through the camera, you look happy, things look great, makeup perfect, hair lovely, but that could also be hiding for many of us what's really going on. And I'm wondering, we're gonna get into the loss of your husband, Sean, but I'm wondering how does such adversity strike you in the morning when you'd rather perhaps some days stay in bed? What is that like for you to be a public face and have to maintain that cheery disposition when perhaps you're not feeling that way. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of the challenges uh, for sure that I have uh, doing what I do because you know a lot of people we all, we all have to work. That's the bottom line, right? We all have to go to work. But I think what's unique about my job is that I have to put on a smile and really deliver information that I hope will be useful to many people, but I have to deliver it in such a way that is pleasant and, and warm and welcoming. Now, I do have sort of a natural disposition. I do tend to look at the cup half full, so I do have that going for me. But that being said, I do have days, and I have them often, where I don't wanna get out of bed. You're absolutely right. I don't want to put on a smile. So there are many days where I will put on that fake smile put it on and force it. And uh, inevitably, uh, it does turn into an actual authentic one because I have so much gratitude. And that's part of my morning routine is that when I wake up, I do uh, say a prayer and, and, and uh, really remember what I'm grateful for. And I have a little private conversation that I have with my husband, Sean, my late husband, Sean. And I try to remember what we talked about before he died. And I try to 
always think about, especially on those darkest days where I don't want to go to bed, I don't want to smile. I think about how he wants us to be happy. He wanted me and our son to live our best lives and to go on without him. And so when I think about the promise that I made him, um, I don't want to let him down. And so I get up out of bed because that motivates me. That motivates me to know that I am going to make him proud today and that I'm going to fulfill my promise of, of choosing joy and choosing happiness for him. I think what you have said probably resonates with so many of us who are on this call today that sometimes we have to fake it until we make it. We have to force that smile until it feels authentic. And so I really appreciate you sharing that because so many times I feel like we should be feeling better. We should be putting on that smile and have it be feeling more authentic than it perhaps it is. But what you're saying is that you somehow made peace with the fake it till you make it sentimentality, you know, that, that sentiment, if you will. And I feel yeah. like that gives us permission um, to take our time. Do you feel like that's true? Oh yeah, absolutely. And trust me, it's, it's tough, uh, tougher than, than sometimes, uh, it is. And I have to give myself grace and, and forgive myself and allow myself to feel these feelings and, and acknowledge. I think that's the first step is acknowledging that, Hey, this is kind of a a crappy day. This is a, you know, this was triggered for me and working on the news. It can happen in the middle of my day. I don't necessarily wake up um, feeling blue or melancholy. It can just come over me because of a certain story that we have talked about on the news. Or I just remember, I think it was three days ago, uh, we were featuring a story about a little kid who had cancer, and uh, it, it was just a trigger. And all of a sudden, I had these feelings, and I remember saying to myself, "Oh, oh, that that's what that is." And I shared it with uh, my work family, my work friends, and so they kind of understood um, what I was going through, perhaps. And you know, sometimes when I when I do share it with them, they, they know right away and they, they actually try a little harder to make me laugh or to take my mind off of something because they know that I, I, I'll need that to get into what I need to do for work. And so, again, I'm so appreciative of, of the support that I have um, on, on, on many days. Yeah, but, but we have to acknowledge it. We have to say, hey, yeah, that, that I feel that way right now. And I'm going to just let it happen. And then hopefully it will leave as quickly as it came. In December, 2015, that was an important moment in your life. Take us back there. Uh, December 28, 2015, to be exact, was the day that my husband took his last breath. He uh, died after 18 months of, of, uh, fighting glioblastoma, which is uh, really one of the most deadly cancers, brain cancer, for which there is no cure. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was an awful day. My son had just turned five, I remember, just a few weeks before, a couple weeks before. And we had just celebrated Christmas. And I remember when my husband had to go th- into hospice that the date of his impending death was coming very close to one, my son's birthday and Christmas. And we just prayed that it wouldn't happen on those key dates because our son was so young. And we just, I just, our main focus was really his well being as well as mine, of course, in our family. And so um, that was a, a tough time for us really those 18 months were the hardest days and nights of my life and for 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 many of you here i know probably the reason why you're here is you have a loved one um i'm sure that have passed on and it's it's really the hardest thing we i've had to go through and um 
every year, it's been six years now since my husband died. And it still sometimes feels like six months ago. And having just gone through the holidays, uh, it's still so fresh and, and, and so close to the surface. I, I don't think that will ever change. I, 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 for some people that have maybe have loved ones that have passed on, you know, 20 years ago or, or such, but I just don't think, I don't know. I, I'm getting used to the pain, I suppose. If you can do me a favor, I know you have a copy of your book to hold up. I would like to invite you to do that. It's called, You Can't Do It Alone. You can't do it alone. And I'm curious if you came up with that title because you thought there was an expectation that you should. Um, as far as the title of this book, I will have to give credit to my editors at Hachette. We, we, we toyed around with different titles and we realized that throughout the book, when, when I was writing it, um, I think I remember saying in the book that I couldn't have gone through this alone. I couldn't have d gone through uh, going through the appointments with my husband alone. And so there was this theme that was working. And so my editor said, what about you can't do it alone? And I said, oh, my gosh, that that is it. That's the title of the book. And it's incredible how we released the book during the pandemic. And I I had said, you know, well, maybe we should hold the release of the book because of the pandemic. And they said, no, 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 this is actually even more important today because of what is happening in the world and how alone so many people are. And, and, and the fact is that we can't go through life alone and you can't go through a cancer diagnosis and, and, and grief alone. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't go through it alone. I want to acknowledge something that is hard to admit for some people. Some people do not have a ready-made close circle to lean on. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have fractured relationships with their closest family. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they're um, not particularly social or perhaps they've had falling out with friends. Maybe they're in a new city um, and they haven't planted those roots yet. And so the idea of not doing something alone, while that can be comforting to many people to hear that, okay, yes, I have friends and I can feel gratitude for that. For others, I think it's important that we acknowledge that those circles are not so ready made. And it's why I feel that what reimagine does Mm -hmm. is in fact so critical. It's why mm -hmm. I think what Domani for Grief does is really so essential. Even a Facebook community, you know, Domani for Grief has a Facebook community that's private that you can join and vent and yell and scream or cry mm -hmm. or yeah. just offer validation. I feel like that's why these virtual communities are not something to be um, dismissed and less yeah. important. For some people, it is their tether to support. What do you say about where your support has come from? Any unusual places? You know, it's interesting that you bring that up. And I completely echo the sentiment that now more than ever, we have so many resources available to us online, um, on Facebook, on social media. For me, I didn't go into this knowing that I had the support of my family and friends. You, much like everyone, you know, we, as a woman, even, we think that we can do everything on our own. We don't want to ask for help. And I've learned through this whole process, and as I've written in this book, um, I have learned to ask for help. I have learned to seek out people who can understand what I was going through at the time. And to be honest, I didn't think my family, my circle of friends, my work family truly understood what I was going through. And so I didn't even know how to ask them for help. And so how it happened for me is that there was a support group. There was a flyer that was put up at the hospital where my husband was getting treatments. And I would see this, this flyer. And for weeks, I would see it and ignore it. I didn't know what it was about. I didn't even think I should be a part of that group because I thought I was going to 
you know, my husband was going to be one of the few in the statistic who was going to beat this thing. And so I really didn't know that I had this resource. And so I finally, one day, I don't know why, but I finally was so confused and so terrified about what I was finding out about glioblastoma and brain cancer. And I felt so alone. I reached out to the support group and I went, and then I realized they were my saviors. They are my, they were your people. They they were were my lifeline. They were my people. And, and so for those who don't have, and I can see some of the chat, um, the comments that there are many people who don't have the family and, and the friendships and, and maybe the church community um, that other people have. There are support groups and, and other resources like Damani, like Let's Reimagine, who are available to you. Please, please reach out and ask for help. And if you have friends and family around even, I, I had to ask for what I needed. And, and that's how it really built on that and, and this notion of you can't do it alone. One of the most important lessons that I've learned after the deaths of both of my parents and then writing so much about grief and loss and my own books about grief and loss is that what you're describing right now about being proactive is actually one of the lessons that I feel like I learned too many years late. I think I could have been much more empowered if I had learned that lesson sooner. And what Mm -hmm. I have since come to discover is this. When loss happens, whether or not we are anticipating it or whether or not it comes suddenly, no matter how it comes, When a death happens, we are completely out of control, right? We can't stop it from coming. And part of what makes being proactive so powerful in the healing process, it restores our sense of agency. It re kind of gives us that feeling that we can marshal our surroundings and mold them to a place that kind of makes sense that we have control over-ish, that we have more control over than what we just endured with the deaf. And so I just wanted to highlight that notion of the power of taking ownership of our own grief journey. And so Maria, I relate so much to what you have said. I think it's one of the most powerful tools we have, which is to stop, take a look around of what we need and do not be passive, be Mm -hmm. proactive. And so I really wanted to just underscore that point. Is there any other way that that helped you, especially in regard, you mentioned your son, Gus, who was five when his dad died. How did you use that sense of power um, to help him? You know, with my son, Gus, I really related to him because in some ways, many ways, actually, when I was seven years old, my own birth father died. And so those early memories for me came flooding back uh, when we realized that uh, that his father was going to die and there was n- no way around it. At some point, we had to accept that fact. And, um, you know, I couldn't have again, not doing it alone, we immediately sought a counselor. And I can't tell you how amazing she has been for us from the beginning until today. I talked to her just the other day and how useful that is. That's the first thing we should all be doing. And I advocate for this. And I even went to Washington, D.C. with a think group, a think tank group, about um, caregivers and what we need to do as a country for our caregivers because we just we're not aware of what's available to us like you said when when you're faced with a loss when you're faced with a diagnosis like a terminal uh, disease you you're paralyzed and and it is difficult to see what is available and and you know what choices you can make and so i'm hoping that some of the laws will change and that in my case when my husband was first diagnosed, I wish that the doctors 
had prescribed something for me uh, in terms of getting um, sort of like a buddy to to walk me through what we could have expected, to walk me through some of the symptoms and and effects that it would have on our lives and, and our son and our family. You know, so these kinds of things. As far as taking control and agency, yes, that I had to learn along the way as well. I am a rep- reporter by nature. And so I did ask a lot of questions and I was a pain in the ass for my, can I say that on here? Can, yes, sure. Can, We're not broadcast TV. Okay. Cause I, I, there are some swear words that, that I use, if you can imagine going through loss and, and the cancer diagnosis, but, um, but what was I saying? Oh, about control. Um, so yes, I, I, I asked a lot of questions. And so I did learn how to advocate and self-advocate, advocate for my husband. So these are the kinds of things that we learn along the way. So hopefully conversations like this can help people, uh, not just because they're going through loss, but sadly, this is something we're all going to have to go through at some point, um, whether it's caring for our elderly parents or for, for a loved one going through some kind of disease, we're all going to go through this at some point. So hopefully through awareness, we can all learn some lessons and, and from this book, hopefully, um, on, on how to be better at taking agency control and, and finding the resources that are available to us. Before I ask you my next question, I want to remind people um, who are on this call today that if you do need to step away, if you have a baby at home, if you're at work, if there's construction in you in your house, don't worry. We are recording this. Uh, you will not miss anything. You can come back and watch this um, at your leisure. I want just to take the pressure off so you know. Um, number two, um, I also, I'm very good at time. So we will be ending at exactly the top of the hour. However, I know for sure that I and Maria Domani reimagine we're kind of open 24 hours a day these days with social media. So I wanted to remind you how to get in touch with Maria if you want to, uh, at the top of the hour when we're done, we're done, but we're not really done. So Maria is everywhere. She is on Facebook. She is on Instagram. She is on Twitter. And you are everywhere at Maria's Earth. Maria's Earth. There's no apostrophe, just Maria's Earth. So that's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You already know about Reimagine, but I'll just remind you again. On Reimagine is Let's Reimagine on Instagram. On Twitter, it's Let's underscore reimagine a little bit more complicated and at facebook it's reimagine end of life i just didn't want everyone to feel um pressure that we only have this time uh together um and it's limited i just wanted to expand the possibilities um but here is my next question for you maria i am really actually very interested Um, We hear a lot about the power of writing for healing, whether it's journal writing or writing letters to our deceased loved ones. Of course, they won't receive them, but somehow it's cathartic. And we can definitely get into that. The reason why letter writing is so beneficial to those who are grieving. I love that scientific research. I would love to share it. If anyone is interested, let me know. I'm wondering for you, you're a meteorologist, you're on TV, you have a day job. What was it for you about the writing process that either felt really good or opened old wounds and felt worse than maybe you were anticipating? Where were you on that scale? How was writing for you? Uh, Well, first of all, writing is not, um, it's not second nature to me. It does, it is not my strong suit. I talk for a living. And so I don't even read anything on the teleprompter. I just speak for a living. So writing did not come naturally. We ad lib. Yes. I ad lib everything that that you see, if you ever see meteorologists on television, we don't we don't read anything, generally speaking, and um, we just ad lib. So writing does not come easy for me in general. And so when I sat down to start writing, to start to write this book, um, 
My, this was part of our promise, by the way, my, my husband and I, my husband is a writer. He was a writer by profession. He was a writer for a lot of television drama and, and television shows. And so when he was first diagnosed with this disease, we thought, why, right? We asked these questions of why, why us? Why is this happening to him? He is so healthy and young. And um, we couldn't help but realize that I wore a microphone every day and he was a writer. And so we thought, you know, this is a still a, a very little known about disease. And so we thought maybe our part of our purpose was to write about this disease and helpful, hopefully shine a light, a bigger light on it so that there could be more funding for research so we could finally find a cure. Brain cancer is one of the least funded uh, diseases for re research uh, in this country, if not the world. And so when he died, I remembered the promise that we made to each other about writing this book. There's very few books as well written on this subject. I think because going through it as a caregiver is so taxing and, and, and painful. And I understand that now why there are very few books on it, not just because there's no cure on the disease, but writing from day one, it took almost three years. Um, but let me interrupt you politely, yes. Yes. hopefully, and drill down for you the actual act of telling your story. You had a collaborator. And I'm just wondering in terms of the peeling back the layers, in terms of having to go perhaps more deeply than maybe you were comfortable with yes. the process. I'm really curious for you. It was, it was painful. It was, healing it was or it, hard. It was painful. It was hard. It was healing. It was cathartic. It was all of the above. Was it worth doing? A hundred percent, absolutely. I cried every day practically in writing this book, but at the same time, I knew that I was healing my heart. And sitting here with you talking about it is also painful. I'm not going to lie to you. It brings me back to those moments. And I'm just at the surface. Like I want to cry, but honestly, I don't want to ruin my makeup because I have to go back on the air um, <laughs> for, for our newscast that's coming up here after I do this. Um, so I'll probably do it on my drive home, but um, it is healing to my heart. And when I talk to you about it, and, and I know that I could be helping someone, I don't care if it's just one person that's being helped by our story, whether it's through their journey of brain cancer or, or having a child so young to have lost their parent. I know that it, it, if it helps someone, it does help my heart and it heals my heart. So I actually thank you for having me here. And um, every tear that was shed by writing this book was worth it. And I know that my husband was right next to me doing it because I, again, I'm not the writer. So I know through me, it was a lot of it was him. I wish I was not in New York right now. Cause I would just get in my car, go <laughs> over to where you are, go <laughs> grab a cup of coffee. And I feel like it wasn't even COVID. I'd want to give you the biggest <laughs> hug because I hear in your voice and I saw that you just dabbed your eye and, um, I'm grateful for your candor. I think that it's really valuable um, for this community to hear um, someone being so real who's in the public eye. And so I thank you. And I know everyone here thanks you very much for your willingness to share so openly. And I want to go with that to the questions and ask Christina. I know um, Maria is a big name in LA and I <laughs> wish we could all follow her uh, from New York and elsewhere. So what kinds of questions is Maria getting that we can throw at her uh, before she has to get back on the air? Um, so when you were talking about the community that you have, we had a lot of listeners talk about their children and how they want to be able to depend on their kids and lean on them um, when they're grieving, um, but they don't want to lean on them too much. And um, how did you find that balance? Well, you know, for me, it was different. Um, I do have two children. I have a, a young son who's now 11. I don't lean on him too much as far as comfort um, and, and, and carrying me through the grief of anything. He, I, I try to guide him with our, with our counselors. 
you really do need to have a good counselor to make sure you give, we give our children the right language. We set the tone for them and how they feel. And we have to recognize when they are grieving because often they don't have the language or the tools in their toolkit yet to be able to recognize what it means when they're triggered by something or when they're feeling melancholy or blue because of a memory. And so I remember when I was a kid, there were very many frightful moments for me. And so that was the last thing I wanted for him. And so uh, I think that's why my husband and I worked quickly and swiftly and we got a counselor right away. And so, and it's rare, our counselor did tell us it was rare that she was able to speak to actually my husband and me and our son since he was, at, at that time, he was three years old when he was first diagnosed. And so it's really important to get a good counselor. I have an older son who is 30 something. Um, and uh, I told him the other day, oh, look at us, we're finally the same age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he's married and, he, and he's got children of his own. And so he has been a different kind of source of support for me. And uh, I'm just really grateful for the both of them because um, they, they are my really my inspiration to just continue to choose joy and, and make my husband proud that we continue to live our best lives. Before Christina goes on to the next question, I wanted to remind everyone to put their questions in the chat. If you prefer to ask your question to Maria or to me anonymously, you can always private message Christina um, and not share your question uh, in the group. So just that's an option for you as well. Um, I do want to talk, you were talking, of course, about Gus, your son, who's now 11. And um, I just ended my term as a very proud board member of the National Alliance for Children's Grief. And I would suggest if you have a child, if you are an aunt or an uncle to a child, if you are mm -hmm. a grandparent to a child, or just you want to learn more about how children process loss, I highly recommend you go on NAGC's or NACG's, they changed the name, uh, NACG's uh, website, the National Alliance for Children's Grief. Um, children grief, children experience loss. The most important thing I can share is to say that by not talking about loss, you are not protecting that child. Children are available and open and ready to have age appropriate conversations about death. That's not to say that a six year old or seven year old is gonna have the same conversation as an 11 year old or a 12 year old. That's why I'm talking about age appropriate discussions. But overall, children benefit from being spoken to directly about grief. Christine, I'll throw it back to you to see if there are other questions. Um, can you talk a little bit more, Maria, about the process of finding a counselor? Like, how did you know what to look for? And did you click with the first one you met with? That's a really great question, because often you don't click right away with the first one. Um, I was very fortunate. There is a, uh, a resource here not too far from where uh, we live and where I work. It's called Our House Grief Center. And it was really through them. It was first through word of mouth. We had a friend of a friend who contacted us right away as soon as my husband got a diagnosis. And she said, make sure you get a counselor right away. And here's someone that I found. And so I think I had called that person and I gave them um, just our situation, the context, and then they referred us to our house and they referred me to the first person we saw, um, uh, Freda, Freda Wasserman. And we saw her a couple of times and then she referred us to Betsy Lautman, who we've been with ever since. And she's just been tremendous. And Allison, you talked about age appropriate language. At that time, my son was three when his dad was first diagnosed. And then when he died, um, Gus was five. And so we really, with her help, 
found the language to talk about the meaning of death, the meaning of cancer and terminal cancer. And we were very careful to talk to him about not using words like your daddy's sick. We never use terms like that because children then will look at themselves if they got sick, that they were going to die. So it's really important to find uh, the right counselor, to find the right language to communicate with children in the right way, because we don't obviously want to harm them or, or cause them any more trauma um, than they need to. I was also very fortunate to uh, partner with Lauren Schneider on the book. She is one of the uh, leading um, family therapists that specializes in grief in children. And so she was able to take different parts of our story and our journey and able to extrapolate and make it more universal um, and, and, and speaking about death with children. I just had an episode with my son the other night and he was crying. He woke up, he had a nightmare and he talked about how he missed his dad. And so, um, you know, so these situations don't end, they continue. He's 11 now and I still depend so much on our counselor for, for these kinds of important talks with him. I think that's a really important point that you just made is that for those of us who have children in our lives and even adults, I actually think now that I'm saying these words out loud, it's generally applicable, um, that a loss endures, that it's not just that day or that week or that even that first year. Um, you just said he had a difficult night um, sleeping and he's now 11. And so paying attention to triggers, I feel is really important. I have two uh, children who are now in college, but when they're, um, when they have experienced loss, when my husband's father passed away, um, paying attention to shifts of uh, friendship groups or changes in grades or their willingness to participate in activities, um, sleeping less, sleeping more, just changes in a general routine um, are really important, I think, for the adults who care for children to pay attention to. Um, I do want to share because I just was reminded of a very quick 30 second, I hope I can say it in a 30 second story about Freda Wasserman. You mentioned oh, Freda Wasserman yeah. at our house in LA and here's my very brief story. So one of my past books is called um, Parentless Parents, how the loss of our mothers and fathers impacts the way we raise our children. And while I was doing research for parentless parents, I was in LA and Freda graciously offered one of her support group rooms for me to do a focus group. And so we were all sitting in a room inside the Our House offices in LA. Maybe there was eight of us, 10 of us, and I'm a New Yorker. So this is just important to the background of the story. And during the focus group, you can imagine the emotions the building starts shaking and it was an earthquake. And oh my gosh. New Yorker. So I'm like freaking out. I'm like, you know, screaming. And everyone in the room was just like, yeah, that's just a little minor shake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the, all the uh, Californians were just kind of chill really and I was really freaked out. Uh, that's Fred. Yeah. yeah. Fred <laughs> was like, so cool. Know. Cool as a cucumber. Yes. Yes. Um, the next question we have is when your husband was sick and after he passed away, how did you manage emotions while you were at work? Did you freeze? How did you recover? And do you have any advice to share with others that they can use in their workplaces? Uh, wow, it was, it was difficult then. It's still difficult at times now. Uh, you know, I, I'm a pretty open book. I've shared not just with my, my audience uh, uh, here in Los Angeles, but obviously the people that I work with. And when I am having a day, when I am having a difficult time, I will tell someone and um, it helps. Even though maybe nothing changes in the exterior, just the fact that I told someone else and someone else acknowledged that they recognized uh, these feelings in me helped tremendously. Um, you know, I, I talk to my counselor all the time. Uh, I have my samurai, as I like to call them, 
um, my core support group from the UCLA Brain Cancer Caregiver Support Group that I still speak to on a very regular basis. So I have my village and I have my people that I hold very close to me. And, and so I just, I just encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, I do have a church community as well that I reach out to and, and uh, Father Eric and, and, and uh, Father Gil that I, that's, that's available to me. And so, you know, there are resources, even when you think that you don't have them, you really do. And, and even as simply as, I don't know if you noticed, but I, I have on my bracelet here that I've been wearing for six years, but this is my husband's wedding ring and my wedding ring and they go together. And so I've always just worn them. And on days where I can't say anything to anyone, I, I don't know if you noticed me doing it, but I do put my fingers in there and it just somehow calms me. And I just feel this instant connection to him and it just, it makes me feel better. And so maybe you have something that you can hold on to if you don't have that ability to speak to someone right away. I know that it gives me comfort. So find your village, reach out, or have a, a piece of something that, uh, that is connecting you to your loved one. And, and I think, you know, it, somehow it'll make you feel better. Well, I'm a big believer in objects and heirlooms and their ability to connect us to our loved ones. I wrote an entire book about it. That's why this series is called Past and Present. It's those of us who have passed away. We can keep them in our present. That's why past is spelled seemingly incorrectly. It's about those who have passed away and keeping them here with us right now. And one of the best ways to do that, I think, is through um, these objects. Um, in past and present, there are 85 ideas for remembering and honoring um, those connections and keeping our loved ones close. Um, Maria, I wanted to ask you a question. And before we got on, you had said nothing is off limits. Mm -hmm. So I am gonna ask you a question. And of course, if it hits a nerve, don't answer it, but I'm curious <laughs> about if you've lost a spouse and many people who are on this call likely have, how about dating mm -hmm. and how does that show up in your life now? Yeah, that's, that's, I get asked that question a lot actually. And I was so surprised that in my core support group, I call the samurai and I write about them in the book. Um, and we all had spouses from varying ages. And, and in this seven of us, there were people in this group that I thought would, they, they swore they would never get remarried. They would never date again. They would never. And I felt the same way. And I would say in about within a year and a half to two years, one met an old love from high school. Another one had met someone new. And so they were so they were lampposts for me beyond my husband's death and and really even till now so i had hope that i might date again and find love again um after two years i finally took the ring off <laughs> as you can see it's on my my bracelet because i got tired of people asking if i got remarried when in actuality it was still the same ring that i had been wearing that whole time but i finally felt comfortable enough to remove the ring. Um, my friend set me up on a couple of dates, like year two, year three, and I just wasn't ready. I think I ghosted a couple of people <laughs> along the way. Um, and it wasn't until last, I would say 2020, it was the year that the pandemic was really in a tight was when I decided I'm going to start dating again. And then the pandemic happened. And then I thought, Oh, okay, maybe I'm not supposed to. Um, and so after five years, uh, after my husband passed away, I finally opened my heart back up and I did, I did start dating and then, and then I met someone last year and I'm not sure where it's going to go, but, um, he's really special and he knows that there's another person in our lives and in our family. And that is Sean. And he is always in our conversation and he's someone who uh, invites and embraces the life that we had. And, and so I don't dismiss that possibility. And, and so, yeah, I've started to open my heart up again.
Thank you for answering that question. I was a little bit hesitant to ask, but since oh, you no. fact open that window for me to ask you a personal question of that nature, I hope I didn't rub you the wrong way, but I think no. dating after the loss of a spouse is something we need to talk about. Um, it's fraught for many people. So I'm grateful that you were so candid and willing to share. It was difficult. I, ha I have to say there were I, a lot of crying. I remember that first date that I had ever, like I remember I ran home crying. Listen, my husband and I did have that conversation before he died. If there were any gifts at all from that diagnosis was that we were able to talk about so many things before he actually passed away. And, and, and one of them was that he wanted us to be happy. He wanted us to live our best lives. And so he wanted me to he said specifically, I want you to meet someone and, and, and meet someone special to be in yours and Gus's lives. And, and so I know that he wants us to be happy. And so I don't close myself off because they, they want us to be happy. You know, our loved ones want us to continue. Christina, let's go back to the questions. We have a question from Chris. He asks, how do you find the strength to be so kind and to share with us openly and with such sincerity? Um, you know, I guess, like I said before, I want to help people because this is something we don't talk about enough. I just, I don't think I remember too many people talking about loss and grief and, and being a young mom still with a young kid. And now I'm seeing on social media that there's actually more resources. There are people that I follow on Instagram and on TikTok that openly discuss um, their loss and grief and dating. And I'm actually thinking about starting a podcast about it because I've learned so many things about dating now. Like people say things like, oh, are you a widow? Oh, I, I'd rather be with a widow with someone who, I mean, like things that are so like, I wouldn't even think was even thought about and and so it's a strange world to be in and and to navigate and so I'm hoping that these open conversations can help illuminate and take the fear out of it for for other people and so well, yeah so I hope that sharing my story can can help someone else as you plan your podcast, <laughs> if you <laughs> all want to pay attention and see what you're up to, I wanted to remind people that in the chat, uh, Christina has put the links to all of your social media channels, but in case you didn't scroll there and you saw it, just to remind everyone on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, you can follow Maria at Maria's Earth. Uh, that's her handle across all uh, platforms. Uh, if you want community, if you're craving community, of course, Reimagine is the platform that has many events that I would urge you to check out. And of course, I um, am partial to what Domani for Grief is doing in their private Facebook group. Um, it's warm and it's accessible and um, it feels um like a secure environment to share and um, share your story and feel validated. So I would just remind you um, of those resources for sure. Um, while we're ending, I know we have five more minutes and I really wanted to get to this and I'm kind of saving for me my favorite topic for last. I'm really interested in keeping connected to those who have died. And I recognized on your website, Maria, that you support a lot of charities. Um, you have their links, you really profile the support that you give uh, to these organizations. And I'm wondering what part of that work is in honor of Sean and does that help you feel more connected to him? Oh, yes, it absolutely is all based on, on Sean and what he would have wanted as well. Again, we talked about um, so many different things and how to uh, help other people. We talked about our purpose and why he was diagnosed with this. And I think we both believe that we're here you know, on earth for a purpose and it's finding what that's about. And we can have multiple purposes is what I believe. And, and, and one of my purpose, uh, my, one of my purposes, obviously I, I think is to be able to share my story in, in hopes of helping other people. And so 
I have this platform and there are um, charities that I believe in. And so hopefully it can benefit not just the brain cancer community and hoping to find a cure or the grief community, but, but just to help those that are underserved. So hopefully I, I can do my part. So I want everyone to go grab a copy of your book, You Can't Do It Alone. But here's my question. Since you were done with copy editing, since that book was all pencils down, since you couldn't make any more changes and since the book was published, what else have you learned? Oh gosh, what else have I learned? Um, well, in regards to dating, I've learned that it all still kind of works. <laughs> I didn't think that it would work. I didn't think that um, I had room in my heart for someone else because my husband was the perfect person for me. Um, so I'm learning that as I grow, I'm learning that my heart can grow as well. And um there is, there are many things that I'm learning about myself, including that I'm stronger than I think I am. And I'm learning that I have a lot more to share with other people. So um, my story's not over. So I'm hoping that there will be another book. <laughs> oh, you heard um, it here first. <laughs> well, I mean, because there, there, you know, when you get to a certain age, you think, oh, well, that was it. That was my happily ever after. But I think I think there's more for, for us. And so I'm hoping to share more of our journey and our adventures and our story. And there's more I've, to learn. I have a new book coming out in September. And I don't think I'm ever writing a book again. <laughs> it is so hard. I, I am. I am just, uh, it's been uh, a different process this time around for sure. And um, mm. wow, it is a, maybe I'll do the podcasting thing. Like, like you're <laughs> suggesting. Uh, in fact, the cover of my book I'm revealing tomorrow for the first oh, time. So if anyone wants to see the cover of my new book, definitely reach out. I could definitely just email me. I'll send you the link to my newsletter when it goes out tomorrow. Exciting to share that finally, because it's been kind of in the works. Um, but as we wrap up, oh, I have two things to say. One, Dara and reimagine, I am so grateful that once again, you have provided this monthly platform for us to come together in such a real and important way. So thank you to reimagine. I want to thank Domani for grief for once again, um, being the support behind um, this initiative. It is so important to me. I really mean what I say the last Thursday of every month, you can find us here every month um, at one o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Please do join us for next month's conversation. And Maria, I told everyone how to find you just because we are wrapping up now doesn't mean we lose the conversation um, with you. And so Maria, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming to uh, tune in. It truly does heal my heart and I just have nothing but gratitude to all of you. And you can reach me outside of here as well. It's easy to find me here in Los Angeles and of course on my website and my social media. So I look forward to that. All right, guys, it's on the nose. I promised an on time departure. So I'll see you guys next month. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. All right, bye guys.